Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, amid mass protests and widespread economic turmoil, Sri Lanka's embattled president, Gotabaya Rajapaska, has fled his country for the Maldives, leaving behind a national state of emergency. Bhavani Fonseca, a human rights lawyer and senior researcher, will be joining me from Colombo, the Sri Lankan capital, for insight into this unprecedented crisis. And the former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was buried this week following his shock assassination. Dr. Sotona Suzuki, a lecturer in modern Japanese history at SOAS University in London, will share her thoughts on the legacy of one of the world's most influential politicians. Then later, more tributes, this time from Angola, following the passing of former President Jose Eduardo dos Santos. Edmilson Angelo, a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, will be joining me for his thoughts. But first, let's start the show with a topic that's dominated the headlines here in the UK this week, the race to become the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. The problems run deep, and I'm in no doubt about the scale of the challenge any new Prime Minister will have to deal with. The underlying economic problems we face have been exacerbated by COVID and by war. But what makes the situation worse is that the answers to our problems Conservative answers haven't been articulated or delivered in a way appropriate to the modern age. We have been in the grip of an underlying economic, social, cultural and intellectual malaise. The right has lost its confidence and courage. Our ability to defend the free market as the fairest way of helping people prosper has been undermined. It has been undermined by a willingness to embrace protectionism for special interests. It's been undermined by retreating in the face of the Ben and Jerry's tendency, those who say a business's main priority is social justice, not productivity and profit, and it's been undermined by the actions of crony capitalists who collude with big bureaucracy to rig the system in favor of incumbents against entrepreneurs. It is not credible to promise lots more spending and lower taxes. And whilst that may be politically inconvenient for me, it is also the truth as is the fact that once we've gripped inflation, I will get the tax burden down. It is a question of when, not if. Recently, I think our party has lost its sense of self. If I can compare it to being in the Glastonbury audience when Paul McCartney was playing his set, <laughs> we indulged all those new tunes, but what we really wanted was the good old stuff that we all knew the words to. Low tax, small state, personal responsibility. We need to get back to that because we've got some really serious challenges ahead. Earlier, I spoke with our business correspondent Simon Pusey in Westminster for some analysis. Simon, I can't believe it's just been a little over a week since the Prime Minister announced his shock resignation and now there are, I believe, six contenders to be the next tenant of Number 10 Downing Street. Who are the front runners? Yeah, six whittled down from eight and it's amazing, isn't it, how many times we've been talking over these weeks and months about can Boris cling on and suddenly it's all happened very fast. And yeah, it came, was down from eight, now down to, to six, I think. You've got Kemi Badnock, obviously, um, sort of a household name there in Nigeria. Um, she's an outsider in terms of what's going to happen here. I think it's really Rishi Sunak seems to be winning every round. Um, then you've got Penny Mordewant, who uh, seems to be popular with the conservative, um, uh, the conservative faithful. But I think it looks like it's going to be Rishi Sunak at the moment. He's the front runner. And of course, he's the one who came out really well during the pandemic. He's the one who stood up in the House of Commons and looked very statesman-like compared to Boris Johnson um, and giving lots of people lots of furlough money. So I think he's kind of, um, among, among the public, he's quite popular and he looks like a, a safe pair of hands. He's obviously been Chancellor uh, for a while now. Um, but there's lots of other people in contention as well and it depends I think really on the Conservative membership in terms of who wins this. But at the moment Rishi Sunak seems to be winning each round. Um, how much damage is this going to do to the Conservative Party is another question because there's been quite a lot of infighting, quite a lot of leaks and people you know, talking badly about each other. Um, and Boris Johnson said in the, in the House of Commons behind us um, a couple of days ago um, that you know, we need to stick together and it needs to be a united party. At the moment it's not a united party because there's a lot of mudslinging. Obviously everyone wants to be the job, wants to have that job as Prime Minister. 
Just uh, very briefly on Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Yes, we did hear from him on Wednesday during PMQs. Is there a tinge of sadness in Britain? Are people sad uh, to see him go or are they happy that um, he's been gotten rid of? I think a lot of Conservative voters did vote for the Conservatives because of Boris in the last um, elections. I think he does sit well with the kind of straight talking, no nonsense, say it how it is kind of people that are often outside of London, that people that just want someone who's sort of straight talking and I think he kind of came across as that. But then there would be obviously many other people that were getting sick of the constant scandal and the, and the lying um, that he's well known for in terms of his whole career really. So I think there'll be two sets of people. I think um, a lot of people probably in the north of the country might think that he's been quite hard done by by, um, by his colleagues and by, by the press but I think a lot of people will think he's brought this on himself so um, he seemed quite jovial at Prime Minister's questions um, and he's obviously staying on now until the, till the autumn so um, I think it, the, the hard thing to see is can Conservatives win the next election with all this mudslinging with all the scandal and Labour obviously lapping it up enjoying every moment of it. Now to our next story. Ongoing clashes between protesters and security forces threaten to pull Sri Lanka deeper into a political abyss. Demonstrations against the economic crisis have simmered for months and came to a head last week, which led to the powerful Rajapaska family fleeing to the Maldives for safety. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Bhavani Fonseca, a human rights lawyer and senior researcher. Bhavani joins me from Colombo, the Sri Lankan capital. Bhavani Fonseca, thanks so much for joining me on Channels Business Global again. Goodness me, the story has definitely developed since we last spoke. A nationwide state of emergency has been declared. Everybody, even our viewers in Nigeria, have all seen the images of demonstrators storming the presidential palace. What does it feel like on the ground? What exactly is happening? Well, it's been a tumultuous last few days. I mean, things have just been so dynamic on the ground. We've had protests that have spanned the last few months really picking up uh, you know in numbers and on saturday july 9th saw the biggest protest converge in colombo and that's when the protesters were able to breach the office of the president and the official residence of the president as well as official residence of the prime minister and yesterday also the office of the prime minister so key buildings of the government uh, were breached by the protesters. But today the protesters have announced they were retreating uh, and returning the public property because things were getting quite volatile in these areas. Um, at the same time, we've had the president who agreed to resign on Saturday fleeing the country unprecedented. We've never had a president leave like this. You know, we've had electoral defeats, but never a president fleeing the country. Um, and we have now an acting prime minister, a president who is also the prime minister, but his, his legitimacy is also being questioned. So massive, massive issues in terms of political stability. And now we have a curfew in force uh, till tomorrow and the military has been called out. So you be, we are seeing images of the military build up in, uh, in Colombo, extremely volatile and extremely concerning as to where, where this is going. We know Sri Lanka are heavily dependent on this bailout from the International Monetary Fund. Lots of countries, particularly in the global south that have received funds from the IMF, describe it as a poison chalice. Yeah, you get the money, but you know, the, there's lots of law and order that doesn't necessarily benefit the people that come uh, with that contract. Are there concerns about that on the ground? Or do you just want to get out of this economic crisis? Are you hoping for more support from neighbours such as India, such as China? Well, there's been support in terms of urgent assistance that has come to Sri Lanka. I mean, the last few months economic situation has worsened and countries such as India has really stepped up. They have given credit lines and humanitarian assistance. Others too have pledged support and provided some urgent assistance. So there is support coming, but it's insufficient in terms of the crisis and the, and the magnitude of the needs on the ground. Now the IMF started and there are discussions ongoing. It's at a technical level. They haven't come to an agreement as such because I think it's much more complex than first anticipated. Uh, but we need a bailout package. I mean, there, there is 
mixed feelings towards an IMF program, but we're in such a deep crisis. We cannot be choosy. We really need to have the IMF support, but also bridge financing. This is critical. IMF alone is not going to be able to take Sri Lanka forward. It's only going to address a percentage of the problem. We need other assistance schemes. But with all of these schemes, it's important to look at what kind of conditionalities come with it. And this is something where we, as civil society, as uh, lawyers, we will be monitoring because we need to make sure whatever conditions are imposed by the international communities for the benefit of Sri Lanka and Sri Lankans. So a lot of things happening on the ground in terms of the economic dimension, but also very worrying in terms of stability as well. We will stay in contact with you. You are you are only source on the ground. Um, so uh, we do hope that things uh, will will settle and a peaceful transition of power will take place imminently. Uh, Bhavani Fonseca, human rights lawyer um, in Colombo, thanks so much for joining me on the show once again. Let's change gears now to focus on a story that has shocked the international community. Thousands of mourners gathered in the streets of Tokyo on Tuesday to bid a final farewell to Japan's former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The statesman was assassinated by a gunman who opened fire as he was delivering a campaign speech in the south of the country on the 8th of July. His death has led to an extraordinary outpouring of grief and sadness. For more on this, I'm now being joined by Dr. Sotona Suzuki, a lecturer in modern Japanese history at SOAS University in London. Dr. Sotona Suzuki, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. It's just such a shame that we have to speak on such a dark um, moment in Japan's history. Uh, firstly, your reaction to Abe's horrific assassination. It's just total disbelief. Um, I'm still in pretty much very much in shock. Um, it's week on, you know, the nation is still suffering from a profound uh, loss um, to this senseless killing. Uh, it's really, really difficult to have my or our heads around it. Um, I've obviously been uh, seeing, I know that he was laid to rest um, in a private funeral on Tuesday. Thousands of uh, mourners were lying, lying in the streets um, in Tokyo. Uh, what is Abe's legacy? Dis um, aside from his economic turnarounds, his statesmanship on the international stage, of course, there's so many tributes have been flooding in from across the international community, including from former President Donald Trump. It's really difficult to find anybody that had any bad word to say about him. Yes. So I think that apart from the fact that he was the longest uh, serving um, prime minister, um, and also he was the youngest prime minister possible Japan and also the first one to be born after the war. Mm. And like you said, uh, he carried out many, many uh, bold political and economic um, uh, reforms. Uh, one of them is Abenomics, um, if you know, just to sort of recover from the uh, political, uh, sorry, economic uh, stagnation. And also he um, he tried to reinvigorate uh, international relations, uh, diplomatic relations with other countries, including, you know, Africa, African nations, not just the United States, Japan's, you know, um, treaty partner and, and the UK as well. So he, he made Japan visible on the global scene. And like, like you said, um, I don't know who could just carry on with this sort of huge presence, domestically and internationally. I think that is um, a big concern going forward, isn't it, um, Dr. Satono? I know you are going to be going into Japan in the next couple of weeks. Are there concerns that a huge vacuum um, has been left behind, not just in terms of his personality, but in terms of his politics? Uh, yes, because he was the, I, I could say he was the most influential politician. Uh, after uh, since Second World War, and also he was like the unifier of the uh, his party LDP, and also the whole political sphere. So the balance of power will be is shaken. So there will be some sort of vacuum, definitely. Thank you so much for your time, and obviously our thoughts and well wishes 
of the entire Japanese community in the United Kingdom and um, back home in Japan. Thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Angola's longtime president died in Spain last week, aged 79, reportedly after a prolonged illness. Jose Eduardo dos Santos became the leader of the oil-rich nation in 1979 and held on to power for 38 often tumultuous and controversial years. Once one of the world's fastest growing economies, little of the windfall made from natural resources made its way to ordinary Angolans. For years, the country's economy has suffered from the effects of lower oil prices and production levels. For more on this, I'm now being joined by Edmilson Angelo, a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. Edmilson joins me from the Angolan capital city, Luanda. Edmilson Angelo, it's been quite a long time since we've spoken on Channels Business Global. And just as I was saying to a previous guest about the assassination of Shinzo Abe, it's unfortunate uh, that we have to talk um, about a passing. Uh, what are your reactions to Eduardo's death? Right. Thank you very much for having me, Juliana. Uh, for me, as a young man of Angola, I think it's, it's, it's a sad moment for the nation. I actually got the news on the day that I actually arrived in Rwanda. And, and, you know, this is the man that has ruled my country since I was born, since I grew up, and pretty much for most of my adult life. So it is indeed a sad moment, even though it was a man that divided opinion. Many people loved him. Some people hated him. But definitely it's a moment for us to reflect as a country. And obviously for us to lose a leader that has been pretty much in, our, you know, in the front of our nation for, for, for almost four decades is a sad moment. And, and, and I think it's a moment of reflection as well. So I was actually, even though the nation was ready for it, because we, we knew that this was going to happen. But I think only now that people are starting to realize that it's really gone. And it is indeed a moment for us to reflect as a nation. Absolutely. He certainly uh, was an individual that divided opinion. Lots of the obituaries um, in the Western press have been difficult uh, to read, but they always are when they're talking about a death of an African uh, leader. But I've got to say much of his legacy was based on your country's relationship with China and the kind of cash for all oil system, which was replicated across the entire uh, continent. Um, it seems that uh, much of Angola's lucrative success only benefited the political elite many still lavish in poverty. Do you think that's a fair statement? Um, I don't think it is a fair statement. I think it's very hard for us to diminish his legacy just on that because at the end of the day, you know, I think the reason why many other countries started to repl replicate what China was doing with Angola is because actually people thought this could be a perfect marriage of convenience. But obviously the end of that marriage hasn't been what we expected it to be. But the reality of the matter is that uh, for him, as somebody that ruled our nation for almost four decades, his legacies are going to move around, you know, being an architect of peace and reconciliation because obviously it ruled the country and, 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 and you know, um, we actually faced one of the longest civil war in the continent that lasted for almost three decades. So we're talking about a leader that actually ruled our country through that. So I think his legacy is going to move around the fact that the way he held the peace and reconciliation process, the fact that he also was the person that implemented multi-party politics here in, in Angola, and obviously, he was the face of Angola's reconstruction, while at the same time, the face of the economic downfall. So I think it is it's extremely hard for us to diminish his legacy just on his relationship with China, because it's part of the last part of the relationship, both for the reconstruction of the country, as well as obviously the downfall of the economy. But, uh, but I think it's definitely something that is also going to be on his resume. Absolutely. Certainly uh, can't diminish um, his uh, legacy. However, it, I think it's pretty fair to say that that money hasn't trickled down to everybody who needs it. We've got similar, oh, we've got similar issues in Nigeria. And a, a, another similarity is the fact that when you are an oil dependent um, economy, mm -hmm. when oil's low, the economy's low. When oil's high, the economy's yeah. high. Um, you know, because of the exactly. war, oil is in demand again. So hopefully the Angolan economy uh, will be booming. You spend much of your time in Sussex. You're in the capital, Luanda, at the moment. What are things like on the ground? How are people uh, coping in this right. post-pandemic uh, recovery? Um, and are people still mourning? Right. So basically, the the, um, the government has actually um, declared a seven day of national mourning for, for Dos Santos. But obviously, things are still a little bit uncertain because obviously, he passed away in Barcelona, mm. where he was for most of his medical assistant. And we're still under this little sort of uncertainty on where it's going to be buried, if it's going to be in Barcelona, if it's going to be in Angola, because there's still this sort of like negotiations going on between the current government as well as his family, because obviously 
under this new current government, the fight against corruption actually attacked most of uh, Dos Santos' family. So now at this moment right now, um, you know, obviously from one side, the family feels like um, they don't really want this um, to happen in Angola. But at the same time, obviously, this is a person that has ruled our country for so long. And it would be so sad to see him being buried somewhere else. So right now, we, we, are still, we are still waiting on that. So I, I would definitely say that we're still mourning because we don't know when the body is going to arrive in Rwanda. But in terms of the pandemic, um, definitely, I think the pandemic for Angola has been a good lesson, but at the same time, a huge opportunity because never like before did we see the country investing massively into the health sector. There's a lot of infrastructure that was built during the pandemic that's still there. And I feel like one of the biggest legacy of um, uh, Lorenzo's first mandate would definitely be the emphasis onto the healthcare, and I think part of that is what happened during the pandemic. So I think right now, I think the, the, the story of the COVID-19 in Angola has been one that we can definitely see as a successful story because of everything that happened during the pandemic and everything that has happened post-pandemic in terms of the health sector. We do hope that Angola, you know, is or will remain one of the fastest growing um, emerging market mm. economies alongside um, its uh, sister, Nigeria. Shall I say yes. big sister? Um, thank you, Ed Milson Angelo uh, from the yep. Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. When you're back in town, come into the studio and see us. Thank you, Ed Milson. According to Interpol, half a billion people in Africa are connected to the Internet with the region home to some of the world's fastest growing online markets businesses and individuals are both attractive and vulnerable to cybercrime. Experts are urging Africa to up its game in the face of criminals targeting the continent's fast-growing internet economy. Well, for more on this topic, I'm now being joined by Tesh Duvasula, the CEO of Africa Data Centers. Tesh joins me from here in the capital. Tesh Devasula, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. So can you just provide some information about what work is being conducted at Africa Data Centers? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me and, and thank you for your audience. Um, Africa Data Centers is in the midst of building the largest pan-African uh, data center infrastructure business in uh, on the continent. We're currently operating in four countries, uh, Togo, Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, and we're going to be expanding to six more over the next three years. Uh, places like uh, Morocco, Egypt, uh, Ghana, Ivory Coast. And uh, from uh, one of the phrases I like to use from, from Casablanca to Cape Town, we'll be able to cover everything and everything in the middle as well. So that's our goal. And we've got about $500 million of, uh, of funding to start this project. And uh, we feel very well capitalized and we've got unbelievable talent in the organization to help us execute this vision. Okay, so how will these uh, centers going to benefit um, Africa's uh, thriving digital economy? So the, every application, every uh, mobile device that you, you own and your friends own, uh, at some point connect to a data center across, uh, across the world. Uh, Africa has one of the greatest opportunities to create more data centers and create more digital infrastructure. And what that basically means is that every African can now participate in the digital economy. The digital world has continued to grow at an uh, epic proportions. And that evolution has happened over the last two to three decades across the rest of the planet. And Africa is now coming into the, 20, the 21st and 22nd century with its infrastructure. And we think that there's going to be uh, lots of opportunity in many of the African countries to, uh, to develop that infrastructure. Um, we look uh, forward uh, to hearing more about your growth. Tesh Devasala, CEO of Africa Data Centers, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you, cheers. Sadly, that's all we have time for today, but as always, do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.